So you um, obviously between teaching uh, and, and and head attending festivals, you clearly have this huge passion in your life for silent films. So when you sit down to work specifically on, on Daring Darlene, how much research do you still have to do and how do you go about it? Yeah, well, my um, film historian background was especially focused on Russian and Soviet film. So... That the history of early Russian film and and Soviet film is is quite different from what was going on in um, New York and New Jersey in the teens. However, I w- as I said, I I went to these silent film festivals every year and would watch literally hundreds of silent films every year brought from archives around the world, including a large number of films filmed in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So I had at least a kind of passive knowledge of what was going on in in the United States and in Fort Lee. And then I learned more when I was teaching um, the history of film, when I started teaching history of film part one. Um, And it was in fact, uh, as as I was teaching the, the serial adventure films week for that, when I thought, oh, you know, um, actually, this could be a good kids book. I should, I should do that. I've done some of the research already. How about that? And then I did. Then I really dug into it. So I love doing research. I mean, that's that's the thing that ties my writing and my academic career together. I I love digging into things and going down rabbit holes and looking at primary sources. Ah, I just love it. So. I started reading a lot about Fort Lee, New Jersey, about early American film history. Um, One of the characters in the book is a real live, well, no, she's no longer alive, but she was at the time alive. That's Elise Guy Blachet, who was one of the first filmmakers in the world. She worked for Gaumont in the, um, starting in the 1890s. So right at the beginning of film history, she was making films of all kinds for the French uh, filmmaker. And then eventually she came to the United States with her husband, who had also a Gaumont employee. And their job was to try to sell America on sound film, actually, because she had been doing a lot of experiment with sound film very, very early. In fact, it turned out to be too early and nobody could believe that that was what we really needed in films. And so that project didn't, happen in the United States. But she started this uh, this film uh, studio, Solox, in Fort Lee, and it was incredibly successful. And she was, you know, one of the most influential women in filmmaking for, for a period there. So I have my fictional characters get tangled up with the real, uh, real live, but fictionalized Madame Blachet. So I, of course, read all sorts of biographies of Alice Guy Blachet and watched her films and um, read her autobiography, read things about her. Um, I paid extra good attention when I was at film festivals for films set in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and you, people may have been irritated by me cheering when a film came on that was made in 1914, set in Fort Lee, and was about like a, I think it was a trolley driver. And I was like, oh my gosh, look at that. That's my trolley. That's my trolley. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I did, I did lots of research like that. I also read through um, all sorts of movie magazines from the time, so fan fan magazine they they were incredibly popular they had huge numbers of people subscribing to them so i read uh, movie star gossip and gossip about uh films being made gossip about Elise Guy Blachet um and then i also focused on uh newspapers and reading about what was going on day by day during at the, on the days that i was describing in my book. So there's a lot in the book that comes right off the front page of the New York Times from, I think it was April 12th, 1914, because the 
Strand Theater actually opened April 11th, 1914, and was covered in the New York Times the next day as, um, and, and in all sorts of other newspapers as well. And there were all sorts of amazing things on the front page of the New York Times on April 12th, 1914. I'm telling you, like the Pope coming down hard on tango. <laughs> that, was, that was under the fold on the front page of the New York Times. And some poor woman who'd been, who had died of mercurial poisoning under, under questionable circumstances and so on and so forth. So some of that um, I snuck into the book as well as just getting a feeling for what the weather was on any given day, how people got from Manhattan over to Fort Lee, taking the ferry. What was that like? What did the ferry look like? Were there spittoons on the ferry? Yes, there were. Um, what, was what was everyday life like for people who were extras in the film studios? How did the film studios run? Um, all of that, really infinite numbers of rabbit holes for me to dig into. So a couple of questions about that. One, I'm, and this is something I, I ask frequently when I talk with uh, history writers, because I find that it's, it's a pretty common trait. I know when I had Avi on, uh, he let me know that he, he checks the weather of every day he writes about. Um, my question is always, unless I'm looking through those papers also, I'm not going to be able to call your bluff if you tell me it was a sunny day and really it was it was rainy. Um, so is it really is it is it just so that you would know that that's off or? Um, well, it's a mix of things, you know. Uh, part of it. So I think it's actually fine to fictionalize a lot when you're writing about the past. So when I was writing. Um, Orphan Band of Springdale, which just came out in paperback, by the way. And Available this was in fine bookstores everywhere as of this moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, it's set in 1941 in rural Maine, and it's based uh, loosely on my mother's childhood. She's sent to live in an orphanage run by her grandmother when things got hard for her family. And... Um, and there, you know, my mother died quite young, so I didn't have access to her to get, there was no one left who actually remembered the true truth. So I had to fictionalize the whole thing. I um, even changed one letter in the name of the town to sort of, as in sort of respect of the differences between my fictional version of things and the real life version of things. And yet I still went through the local paper and read through everything that happened that year and used lots and lots of that in the book. So I think whenever we're writing anything, it's always a mixture of fiction and fact. But I think that digging into what happened in the past um, deepens your stories, even the fictional sides of them somehow. And you find things that you don't expect. You know, if you, it's, I guess it's sort of like that uh, plotting versus pantsing uh, question again. That if you if you think you already know everything about some period and you're just going to write the thing that you think you know and you haven't gotten your hands dirty digging into the primary sources and reading through the local papers and everything, you won't know all the riches and strangenesses that were there waiting to be dug up. Some of them you may not use, but but they kind they do just add this. Um, three-dimensional feeling to the historical world that you're creating. I think also um, at silent film festivals, so silent film fans and historians tend to love details. So you can be sure that there are going to be people who are going to find everything I got wrong. <laughs> just as, you know, there are people who just know so much about silent film that that one of the things one of the games they used to play in this uh big festival is they would p archivists would bring little bits of film that they found in their archive and they have no idea what it is and they would screen those and you'd have this audience of a thousand film historians and film um fans and so on there and people would just shout out oh that's so and so and, and they would know who these actors were what studio it was, or 
where that outdoor location was. There are people who can recognize every building in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and tell you when it shows up in a film. And they'll go, okay, that was on such and such a street, da 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 da. So I think part of that kind of infects me as well, you know, from coming out of a film historian background. You, you kind you want to have because it's it's so thrilling. I really think the the material that comes out of uh, the worlds of the past is actually fascinating in and of itself. So I love digging it up. So you've got those uh, people in the back of your mind, like if I don't get this right, they are going to crucify me when I see them again. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I think you know, I'm all right. I know I'm all right with it. It's actually it's fine. Um, but you, but, you know, I think it's more that in fact, I'm thinking this little, this little tidbit, <laughs> almost nobody is going to recognize what I'm really talking about here or the real thing that this is actually a reference to, but some people are going, going to be saying, oh, that's the Strand Theater. Opened April 11th, 1914. One of the most exciting theater openings, you know, of its day. Woo! Can't believe, is she going to get the color scheme right in the theater? Read, 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 read. Oh, she's got the color scheme right. She remembered the little fountains in the front of the screen. Woo! So it's going to make somebody happy. Are you one of those people when you read historical fiction? Do you look for those types of details? Do they make you happy? They make me happy. When I find... When I find a detail that has some resonance with um, the world, I yes, it does make me happy. And just in, in, in talking to you and the amount of research and work you, you, you've done, plus your, your background, your enthusiasm for film, the version I have, and of course I've got the advanced reader's copy, uh, there's only, only uh, 345 pages, but I get the sense you could easily have written for 700, 800 pages, maybe 1,000. So out of all those details that you have, how are you distilling them and, and getting this into a, a tight narrative? Because it's not a history lesson. Like you say, there's uh, cliffhangers almost every chapter. You, you're going to move right along. How do you distill that to make sure that you have those nice moments for the, the history buffs, plus also all the young readers that need to, to learn the history without, without making it feel like a history lesson or bogging down your narrative too much to allow for all that? I guess part of it is that, okay, I don't think of historical detail as, as medicine or as the thing that you need to learn or so on. I think of it as the hidden jewel, that little treasure that you can dig up. Um, it's that's what I, I that's what I I love that. And I think that I think that kids actually react well to that sort of thing too. If you're giving them details that are like treasures, they're not they're not things they're going to be tested on. Um, it's not about making them learn lessons for the lesson's sake. It's it's discovering how wonderful it is to dig up treasure in the past, to, to read about uh, things that really happened and so on. So, but the, the question of how do you not get overwhelmed by details? Well, of course you do get overwhelmed by details. I mean, that, that just happens. But then once again, you have the notebook. So you go through your notebook, um, you, you have, and there are all sorts of things in here that did not end up in. <laughs> that did not end up in the book. And, you know, you, you can't put everything, you can't put everything in the book. So you're just trying to give little like tips of icebergs, right? Little kind of jewel-like shining in the sun tips of really interesting historical icebergs. And you just hope that some kids are going to dig a little bit further. I remember being that kid reading, a, this is not a historical book at all, but reading um, Madeline Lengel's A Wind in the Door, which you may recall uh, has all this stuff about the mitochondrion in it. And I remember, how, and the mitochondrion is like a kind of world that you can go into it. I remember how thrilled I was when I found out that that was a real thing. Now, her just depiction of it wasn't real at all. <laughs> it was completely <laughs> fantastic and magical. Um, but the fact that that had a tie to this whole other story that was like the miracles of biology <laughs> meant something to me. I just love seeing that kind of 
tie and link and connection.